December 2014 is different. VIPs from NASA are on hand. Two film crews document the action as Alan explains the benefits of hibernation. Um, it lowers our cost because we don't need to have people babysitting the spacecraft 24-7. Outside interest in New Horizons is building. If all goes well, New Horizons will stay awake, flying by Pluto in July 2015, and then returning data until October 2016. Copy that. Thank you, GNCs. Tonight, data trickles in, and Alice has to wait to be certain New Horizons is fully awake. We should be getting it momentarily. It should be any minute now. It's like watching paint dry. I figure if I stare at the screen hard enough. And Packet 5 just came in. There we go. There we go. PI, PM, Mom on Pluto 1. We have a nominal wake up of the New Horizon spacecraft on its way to Pluto. We're ready for our next leg of the journey. Bear. He's going to be here for a while. This is a watershed day. We have completed the cruise across three billion miles of space. The spacecraft is now awake. Finally, uh, after nine years, I'm glad to see hibernation behind us and active ops ahead. On to Pluto. But there are still hundreds of tasks to ensure a safe flyby in July 2015. January 27th, New Horizons has been sending back technical data and all seems fine. But today is the first time Hal Weaver and Andy Cheng will be seeing new science images. I thought I saw it pop up here. Yeah, let's try that again. Cheng is lead scientist for the LORI camera. LORI is used for navigation to find the targets and to correct the trajectory so we get to the right place at the right time. Voltages, currents, temperatures all look normal. Uh, no error messages. This is it. Uh, let's, let's check out the uh, very first images. And then Sharon, right there, peak pixel 55. That's right. Okay. <laughs> All right, so Great. there they are. Let's look at the whole For field. project scientist Hal Weaver, even the jump in size from one to two pixels was significant. This is a real milestone in the New Horizons mission, the very first images of Pluto in the Pluto encounter year. Uh, hadn't turned Lori on, hadn't gotten any images since last summer, last July. But this is it. This is the start of it. How she blows. We really don't know what we're going to see. That's what this mission is all about. What is the surface of Pluto really like? How big is it? What are the orbits really? So it's nothing but uh, delightful surprises coming for us. But some of the surprises may not be quite so welcome. As New Horizons gets still closer to the Pluto system, Lori will be able to identify small moons and possible rings that can't be seen from Earth. John Spencer is leading the UHAS campaign. UHAS stands for Unknown Hazards. We may find new moons or even rings around Pluto. And if we see anything like that, we're going to want to determine whether it poses a threat to the spacecraft, because if it does, if there's debris that we might run into that might damage or kill the spacecraft, then we want to uh, evaluate that hazard and determine whether we should take any ev evasive action. To find out just how vulnerable New Horizons might be to even tiny dust particles, the mission sent samples of spacecraft components to the White Sands test range. Technicians at White Sands set up gun tests to assess how vulnerable New Horizons outer covers and cables might be. We went to two facilities that could shoot things into parts of uh, models of the spacecraft. While the results might look dangerous, the mission has options to take evasive action. One of the backup strategies we have if we feel we need to give the spacecraft extra protection is that we orient it so that the high gain antenna here, which is um, literally pretty bulletproof and can protect the spacecraft, is going to be facing forward in the ram direction. And this is ram in the sense of battering ram. It's a direction in which stuff will be coming at us and ramming into the spacecraft. And if that is facing forward, then any dust particles that hit the spacecraft are most likely to hit that antenna where they won't 
causes problems, and only a small part of the spacecraft around the edges is going to be exposed to those particles. That would protect the guts of the spacecraft, but limit the pointing of the cameras. The, the cameras are fixed to the spacecraft, so if the spacecraft has to point, point in one direction, the cameras can only point in a limited range of directions. This limits the amount of times we can photograph the system as we go past, because we can only photograph objects when they're just in the right angle that we can look at them while protecting the spacecraft with the main antenna. Another option is to take different trajectories through the Pluto system. That's called the Shabbat play. Shabbat is the best acronym in the space business. <laughs> It stands for safe haven by other trajectory. And it is, it is the word we use to represent our backup plans at Pluto. And the second Shabbat takes us much closer to Pluto um, into the region where atmospheric drag uh, depletes orbits of any debris, which we think would be uh, the safest Hail Mary pass that we could fly if we have to do something different than the nominal. We are coming into the Pluto system with the ability, if we learn something we don't expect, to be able to make uh, a change and, uh, and get the goods. But those decisions can only be made in the last month before closest approach, and there'll be limited time to evaluate the best options. So in February 2015, Spencer's UHAS team, including ring specialist Mark Showalter and postdoc Simon Porter, are running through a readiness test. Now they're on the clock and being scored for whether they can work through the calculations fast enough to decide on a trajectory correction maneuver that might prevent loss of mission. And that makes this exercise more critical than any that have gone before. The difference between this and previous operational readiness tests is that this is where we have to demonstrate to the project and NASA that we can do this. But the only test that really matters comes on July 14th, 2015. That one day will pay off 26 years of dreams and nine years in flight. For the science team, the year of Pluto began with another meeting to review the latest data on the Pluto system and to hear updates on how the spacecraft was performing. Mission manager Glenn Fountain who'd been with the project from its start, summarized remaining risks. Red boxes are possibilities that could kill the mission. But now, in 2015, there are more and more green boxes, risks that have been minimized. Something that we haven't thought of still might happen, but I'm confident that whatever happens, whatever fate throws at us, this team will be able to resolve it and we'll go on to get wonderful data when we get to Pluto. We have a fantastically talented team of people who have worked very hard and we've tested the sequences inside and out. And while there are always unknown unknowns, I'm very confident and really looking forward to the curtain rising. Along with mind-bending technical details, there also was a sense of history in the making. To document the long years of effort to get this close to Pluto, the mission recreated a team photograph taken in 2004. As Glenn, Alan, and Alice had carefully planned back then, many of the scientists and engineers were still actively engaged in New Horizons and looking forward to July 2015. We have worked hard to get a coherent team because if you don't have a good team to operate the spacecraft, to do the planning, you will fail. And so we worked a plan early in the mission to have younger people uh, with the right amount of experience to be on the mission. And it's just like watching your kids grow. It's like all of a sudden, where did the time go? You know, they are older, they're more mature, and they're now the, the very experienced veterans. But the hard work of mission planning was by no means over even this close to Encounter Day. While exploring Pluto in 2015 is exciting in itself, New Horizons was recommended in part as a mission that might continue on farther out into the Kuiper Belt. That takes identifying potential targets now for a still more distant flyby, should NASA approve an extended mission. This challenging task was assigned to John Spencer, Mark Bowie, and a team of young postdocs. 
And like everything else about this mission, it wasn't easy. Bowie and John Spencer had been using Earth's largest telescopes in Hawaii and Chile, but even Earth's best couldn't crack this task. But the basic problem is the Earth's atmosphere is just a, a mess at these scales. There's a limit, and that's what we've been beating our heads against. Now with time running out, we had to turn to Hubble. And so it's, we sort of, not so jokingly, talk about Hubble to the rescue. Without Hubble, we would not have these objects. Mark and his young collaborators came up with innovative search techniques using custom software. What that does is makes the stars smear out and makes the Kuiper Belt objects hold still. It's been a lot of work, but to do something as exciting as this has been just so much fun. I've been plugging through the data today because it's fresh data and I just really, really wanted to to know what the answer was. Well, we would have been in big trouble if we didn't find the KBO in time. So there was this pressure, but honestly, we had the best the people in the world working on the problem so and we did it. And we just do the math, write the software, crunch the pixels, and then I create this graphic. And from that point on, it's what I call wetware. It's what you got in your head. In reality, KBOs are moving against the fixed stars. Mark came up with a way of making them more obvious by flipping that around and making the stars appear to move and any KBOs stand still. Right in the middle, there's something that's just holding dead constant. And that's the Kuiper Belt object. You can't argue with that. It was a high-tech variant of the approach that had been instrumental in exploring the Pluto system right from the start. But at the core, it's a technique that hasn't really changed since Tom Bell's day. You have two pictures of the sky taken at different times, and you're looking for the stuff that moves. As soon as you see something real, there is absolutely no question about it. As soon as it flashes on the screen in just a millisecond, there it is, it's real, and you know, I found another Kuiper Belt object. But finding a KBO is only half the battle. Is it located where New Horizons can reach it with available fuel? And once you have the orbit, and we, and we know where the spacecraft is and where it's going to be, we can figure out how much fuel the spacecraft is going to need to use to get to the, these objects. With more Hubble time, New Horizons got a pleasant surprise. It looked like we might actually have to burn the engines to miss the object, <laughs> which was a pretty exciting concept. You know, it's a good thing we looked, because you wouldn't want to run into one of these things. These cold classicals, they're pretty much as they were 4.5 billion years ago. They're little fossils. Yeah, that's incredible. <laughs> we have no idea what they're going to look like. So with potential targets found at last, it was on the Pluto. I'm feeling pretty exhilarated at this point. You know, you're at the top of the roller coaster. You're about to go down that dizzying, thrilling uh, ride into the system. Just seeing Pluto there getting bigger and bigger, it gives me goosebumps. Today, we're only a few months away from the encounter. We're less than an astronomical unit, the distance between the Earth and the Sun, that distance away from this fascinating object. It's the last major body in our solar system that we really need to visit. To be putting the capstone on the initial reconnaissance of the solar system, it's heartwarming, and it, it, it feels like something that makes a career worthwhile. As spacecraft goes, New Horizons is a very small team, but still, we've been working on this for over a decade, and you add it all up, and it's about two and a half million work hours to get ourselves to Pluto. We have waited first the four years that we couldn't hardly think about because we were running so fast, and then it is, oh, we wait, and we wait, and now we are ready to begin the encounter.